So as I've worked on this, especially out of the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a book that King Solomon writes, uh, Old Testament guy. Um, so about 3,000 years ago, um, he, is, he is writing this. And one of the things that I struggle with, I, this week I struggle with a lot. I was praying, I was saying, Lord, can't we have an encouraging message? Because the book is pretty discouraging, you know? It's just like, again, and, and uh, when, when you think about it, Solomon, of all people, shouldn't he write really encouraging things? He's the wisest guy in his day. There was no king that was ever like him. Why, why, is, it so, why is it so discouraging? And, and to set it up, let me, let, me, let me tell you what. In the mornings, um, I'll, on Sunday mornings, I will listen to someone else either teaching the passage that we're gonna use or preaching from it. Uh, I know you think, well, you should prepare earlier than that. I understand. I just, it's because on Sunday mornings, I just wanna hear someone else's perspective, but I don't do it ahead of time when I'm working on it for sometimes weeks or you know, even sometimes longer than that because I don't want their application or whatever to influence me as I'm trying to dig it out myself. So just to let you know. But I do listen to him. And there was a guy this morning, I was listening to him, and he was saying um, Solomon uh, is writing this because he's doing this during the, one of the lowest times in Israel's history. So if you know history as far as Israel is concerned, you're like the same thing I said uh, to the speaker this morning because I, I listened to it in the shower. I have a speaker built in and I go, what? What are you talking about, right? Because this is not one of the lowest time in Israel's history. This is the grandest time in Israel's history. Solomon has more gold than he knows what to do with. They even said that Solomon puts away the silver because there's just not room for it with all the gold around. They've expanded greater uh, to greater territories than they've ever expanded before. Solomon's reputation worldwide as he lives is greater than anyone who had ever come before him in Israel because he, he's known because of his great wisdom, their great wealth, their great expansion. How can you say this is the lowest time in their history? Well, I, I, he's talking about how Solomon is viewing it and he's trying to equate to it, but it jumped out at me. Sometimes, when everything's going well, when everything seems so good, you can go through the most difficult, d depressing, disparaging times in your life. Why? Because like Solomon, Solomon looked at it and he said, shouldn't it be better than this? I'm wise. I'm really smart. I've got it all figured out. We've done things that, that in Israel have never been done before. Shouldn't it feel better? Shouldn't it be better than this. You ever feel that way? Maybe, maybe you feel that way now. Maybe you look at it and say, I, I think it's because Solomon confuses some things. In fact, this may, you may struggle with this, and, and I'm okay if you do, but as I look at Solomon's gift that God gives him, the, the gift of wisdom, uh, the wisdom that he asks for from God is the wisdom to be able to lead and rule over Israel uh, in a good way, in a way that would please God, but that, that really equates itself to an earthly wisdom and Solomon was great at an earthly wisdom. He knew how to deal with people, deal with things. He, the Proverbs are just some incredible wise sayings that are in there. But the, the struggle with it is you can grab a hold of that kind of wisdom and that kind of even, even prosperity and fame and think that's gonna satisfy me. And it doesn't. <laughs> it, it, it does temporarily, but ultimately, you're left still with a, a struggle. Just to let you know, um, I was, as a kid growing up, I came up through a time that was known as the, uh, the hippie era, right? And I was not a hippie, just to let you know. So, uh, because my parents wouldn't allow me to be, I probably would have if they'd have let me. And, uh, but I came up during that time and I was around that time and it's an interesting time in our country because after World War II, give you a little history lesson, I love history. After World War II, the United States became the most prosperous nation that the world has ever seen and ever known. And it was because of World War II. So at the end of World War II, it was all fought on other people's land in Europe and in Africa and Asia. I mean, all, that, all those places where the war went on and the United States had very little activity as far as the war was concerned on our own land, a little bit, but not much, but we were the supplier. We built things, we put up industries. Ford Motor Company had to start making tanks. I mean, you know, you just went after all this stuff and there's all this industry built in our country when the rest of the world during World War II was destroyed. I mean, it was just torn down. 
And so the, you may not know this. I thought it was interesting when I, when I uh, read this for the very first time. There are a lot of war debts and not from those we defeated, from our allies. We had supplied so much to so many other nations that they owed us still from all that. And the United States did this incredible thing at the time and it was brilliant. They forgave all of those debts. And you think, what? You mean we walked away from that money? Let me tell you why. Because if they forgave the debts, all of these nations had to rebuild. They were destroyed. They'd gone through all so much trauma. And where were they gonna buy everything they needed? All the technology, all the industry, well, they were gonna buy it from us. And we became wealthier than we'd ever become before. So that when my parents, you know, when they came up, uh, and they were younger during the war, and they come up in the, in the time when, you know, it's just like it's never been before. I still remember a picture of my dad um, he came out of the uh, military as a captain in the Air Force. Uh, he, he goes in as, a, as a, somebody who failed the 10th grade. He flunked the 10th grade. He comes out as a doctor um, out of the military because his life totally has changed through all this. He comes out. I still remember the picture of him standing there dapper in his uniform with my mom. They had nothing, but they loved life. You know, they didn't have a car. They had no, no, no place at my dad. When he was an, uh, a resident, he came out making $50 a week. That's what he made, but they were on top of the world. And he's standing there with a cigarette in his hand, smoking a Lucky Stripes or something, you know, and looking real dapper as some, you know, 23-year-old or whatever, you know, and I think, man, on top of the world, you know. Just, just got life, you know, in your hands and you're just moving forward. And then... When I come along, a little bit younger, there's, there's the hippie movement, right? What was the hippie movement about? Do you remember? Do you know? The hippie movement was about this. A new generation rose up. They did not know anything about World War II. They'd not gone through that. And they were rejecting everything about the nation and about the generation before them. They were rejecting all of it. Why? Because they did not see it as something that would help. It's all they knew was the hippie movement. They didn't know the time before. And so the generation before them really struggled with, why, why are you doing that? Don't you understand what we went through? The sacrifices, the fighting, the war. They, they didn't because they'd never gone through that before. And a gen new generation came up and they started chasing uh, sexuality and they started chasing drugs. I still remember it's a phrase that I still think is, is funny for us today. They would drop acid. That's what it was called. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? That would burn, you know, but they, you know, that's, that's just what they would do. And they were searching and searching. And if you saw the movie, it came out a year ago called the Jesus Revolution. Jesus Revolution was something made Time Magazine, a, a new movement in Christianity, a new, a new wave. I mean, it was, it was just incredible what was happening and, and during the the Jesus movement something all of a sudden happened among this this hippie movement this generation that was there that had had never happened before and people are like this is this is wild this is this is crazy why would these people and it's displayed in that movie if you had never seen it, it's really good you know they're looking for something in fact the guy who plays uh, Lonnie Frisbee in the movie uh, I still remember this one scene where he's talking to the preacher that's there and he's, he's he says he says they're looking for God man that's how you know they're a hippie right everything ends with man they're looking for a God man don't you get it and that is what they were looking for they're looking for something bigger better than you know what their parents said. They were looking for something with more meaning to it than just you know, all this, even the prosperity that they had. They were looking for some kind of connection that, that, that they did not have and they did not see and they were chasing it in all the wrong ways. Yes, they were, but that's what they were looking for. Chuck Smith in the movie, he's passed away and Chuck was uh, great. I was listening to one interview with him um, that was, I guess, done 15, 20 years ago and uh, Chuck is known for, uh, as, a, as a preacher for going verse by verse, chapter by chapter in the Bible. And so he was being asked about this, you know, this, this great method, you know, of doing this and why that made all the difference. And Chuck said, well, hang on. He said, it's not as noble as you think. He said, uh, he said I, I had about two years of sermons, lived in California. He said, so every two years I had to leave the church I was at and go to another church because I was out of sermons. And um, so he said, so this is the reality, the practicality of it. Chuck says, so what happened is I moved to a place in California that the surfing was unbelievable, better than any surfing ever, and the taxes were low. This was a different 
era in California. So just say, like, okay, so, the, you know, and he said, I was like, I, I don't wanna leave here. I wanna stay here. This is, this is so good. I, how can I possibly leave here? And he said, but I'm gonna run out of sermons, you know, in another year because he's doing his normal thing. And so he said, I gotta find some other method. He said, what if I just started going through the books of the Bible, chapter, he said, I could go for the rest of my life and never finish all of that. And so he switched methods surely because he wanted to surf and stay in that area. That was the, and he says that. He says, so don't give me all this credit for something and whatever. And what happened was, as they would come, because what they did do is they tried as best they could to sort of embrace the hippies. They didn't know what to do or how to do it, but they tried to do it. And, and the music of the hippie movement is part of what, a huge part of what God used to bring a new generation and to just bring this, this wild revival in our country for a relationship with God. Isn't that crazy? I understand because even though I wasn't a hippie, I was kind of part of that movement coming up and there was a couple in our town who uh, rented a Girl Scout hut in our town and uh, for $1 from the city. And their, their premise was, we will try to get kids off of drugs because drugs were enormous at this time uh, in the country. And, and where my little town was, was a place where, because they'd cracked down the drugs in one city, it had gone to our little town as the, as the point to go through on its way to Atlanta. And so uh, this, the town got hit pretty hard. Uh, every year they'd have to fill out a report and, and who they had helped to get off drugs and all too. But their real purpose, their real purpose was to reach as many young people as they could with the message of the gospel in a relationship to Jesus Christ. And so during my time uh, in high school and then when I was in college, I would come back, probably 300 kids went through this little Girl Scout hut, the, the movement that was there, only hold about 20 people, but they were outside in the parking lot, in different places. We, we would play music. Uh, I was a part of several groups at the time. And uh, several, of the, several of the people in, in that group went on to have record contracts in Nashville, and even a larger group ended up either with Camps Crusade, the Navigators, and Varsity, churches, pastors, which is I am now, because there was just this incredible movement among these young people. It's not because we had it all right. I just want to make sure you understand. We had a lot of stuff wrong. And, and some of the songs I even look back at that we sang when we would go and sing at different churches or different events that we got invited to, I'm like, I can't believe we sang that. Where did we get those words from or, you know, whatever. But, but we were, something was going on. There was some kind of movement that was happening inside of us. And this is, this is my point that I want to I throw out to you because Solomon also and because of us. It wasn't a denomination. It was not a religious group that made it happen. It was God doing it through the most unlikely avenue that you could possibly come up with. That's what God does. And he does it so that you and I would understand he is the one that is doing this, not us. I know because I'm around preachers all the time and they were talking about what do we need to do to bring revival and we've got, we can make this happen. You don't bring revival, you don't. Now you, you can be a part of it, you can say God I'm available, God brings revival. He's the only one that brings revival because God is the one that moves the heart of a young man or a young woman. He's the only one that can change who we are on the inside. And he does it at his own whim and his own desire to accomplish his, his own purposes. Now, like I said, you and I can say, God, I, I'm available. I wanna be a part, but you don't get to make it happen. In fact, it did not happen through any of the normal religious groups, whatever. It affected them but it did not happen through those. I still remember uh, when I was young, we would go to uh, uh, Hilton Head. My dad owned some property there. And um, as we go, we go to a Presbyterian church. I was Presbyterian. And this Presbyterian church during the summer, they'd have a guy stand up, sit up there with a guitar and he'd sit on a stool and play. It's kind of a hippie-ish kind of thing, yeah. Sing some courses. And that's what they did during the summer because they knew people were coming in there for vacation times. And I remember asking my dad, I said, that's great, man. That's just really cool. Why can't we do that in our president church back home? And he said, well, you can't do that. That's, all he, that's the only thing he ever said. You can't do that. I was like, why not? I don't know, but you can't do that. You know, it's just not, it's just not the way it works. And uh, yeah, but, but, but it was through that that the changes were occurring. Uh, can I say something about, because um, I had this discussion with a good friend, somebody uh, this week, and it was really good, but it's always we go through this. 
I grew up with all the old hymns. I grew up with the music of the, of the church. And I'm not talking about what you might think of as old hymns. I mean the old hymns. In the Presbyterian Church, you sang Reformation era hymns. I mean, they're 400 years old. So I knew all the old hymns, still do. I love the words of it. Privately, I will still sing them. But I love the new music. I, I love what, what, what is sung. I love the words. It's not that it's all correct or it's, or it's all right, but neither one of all the old hymns either. It, it's because it's a new generation that God is moving in their hearts. He's moving in their life. They'll make a lot of mistakes, but they're, they're singing about this relationship to God as best they can in their own music, in their own terms. In their own. That's not a bad thing. That is a wonderful thing. In fact, I will tell you this, firmly believe this. If, if you are only singing the songs that are from another generation or the generation before that, if those are the only things that have been, we're singing and we've locked into that, something, is, something bad is wrong. Because that means you've got a new generation who have lost the connection with God. Because every generation will sing about, write about, they will celebrate what they have connected with, including the hippie aids, connected with the wrong things, right? But some of them came out of it with a totally different connection, a new connection to God. Say I told you about 300 uh, young men and women came out of that movement over about a 12-year period. Eventually, it's my estimation, don't, don't have any numbers uh, on that, about a third of them fell away, just to let you know. Uh, they went back to old things, different things. It was kind of a fad, a movement, and then they went to another. That's all right. That, that's, just, that's just part of the way it works sometimes. But from it, God did just an incredible work, um, and he did it despite the things that we think. This, this will fix it, man. We've got so much money. We have so much technology. God moves in the hearts of people. So anyway, all that was to set all this up. I know you're going to like, man, this is going to be a long message. It's not. So uh, here's what I put in the uh, beginning of it because this is, this is Solomon's struggle also. So I put in here that Solomon, he was searching for what he could do to overcome his despair. Why is he in despair? Because all the things that he thinks should get him out of this that he has are not going to be the things that are gonna get him out of this because they are, they are just things of this life. He's wise about them, he's smart, but he's struggling because Solomon is trying to figure it out himself and figure out how he can, how he can work his way out of this. So here's what he says in chapter three. You probably are familiar with these uh, words. Uh, this is what he says in verse number one. He says, for everything um, there, is, there is a what? A season, yeah, there's a time for it. That time comes, that time goes. He says, a time for every activity under heaven. That means everything that we do, everything that we go through, there is a rhythm to it, there's a season to it, a time to do it, a time to stop doing it. You know. And, and this is the desire of people is to figure out the, the what they're supposed to do. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to be a part of? Yes, those things change and they, and they move, but you're still trying to figure out what those what's are. He says this in verse two. He says, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build up, a time to cry, and a time to laugh. He says, a time to grieve, and a time to dance. Don't you like dancing better? Okay, we're not dancers, but you know, if we were, right? We'd say, yeah, I'd rather be in the time to dance than the time to grieve. He says a time to scatter stones, and he says a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, stop searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. I know my wife especially likes the time to gather and the times to throw away because my wife is big on get rid of it. <laughs> Does anybody have one of those in the house? So have you worn this lately? We're giving it away then. So she's like, you know, because it's a different time. Culturally, we're at a different time. My mom kept everything. I mean, she kept all the newspapers, you know, which are really good to stack outside in the garage and then little critters can find homes in, in the newspapers. And, and she would keep the tin foil that you would use. She would wash it, unfold it, and stack it back up to keep it because she came up in a different time. 
time, you know, going into the war, coming, you know, out of the, the Great Depression that we didn't have anything. In fact, my favorite was I would go home, and you know those little tubs that butter came in? where well, they were using margarine then. And it was plastic tubs. I mean, hundreds of them stacked up. I'm like, Mom, what, you know, I, well, you never know when you might need, uh, you know, okay, when they, you know, you have to go get your own butter. I don't know. So it's, you know, but it was just a different time, and we don't do that. And I'm glad we don't do that. And my wife tries to make sure that we don't do that because it's just clutter. It's just stuff that we need to get rid of. It, it holds us back. It burdens us down. So she's always like, let's give it away to someone else um, who could use it, who would uh, need it. So here's what Solomon says in the next paragraph. Listen to this. This is good. He says, what do people really get for all their hard work? Well, that's negative, Solomon. You know, what do you mean? You know, how, why would you say that? He says, I've seen the burden that God places on us all. I don't think Solomon is talking about the burden of work. I think he's gonna clarify it. I think he's talking about the burden of why am I doing this? What does it amount to? What, what is it good for? And, and yeah, that's exactly what he'll say as he clarifies it. Listen to this. He says, um, yet God has made everything, say this with me, beautiful in its time. Yeah, so there's a place for it. He has placed eternity in the human heart. There's something that we understand about life is more than just what we're going through now. There's a perspective that we have. It's what makes us unique of all the other parts of creation. It's, it's a part of how we connect to God. He says, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning to the end. That's what he's talking about. Man, what a burden, God. I work, I do these things but I can't figure out how does this fit in the whole picture? What, what does this mean? Because it's there and it's gone. Whew. Time to start it, time to end it. Why do we do this? Why do we go through all this? And Solomon wants to know. He's, he's trying to figure it out. He says this, which is true. No one knows what God has planned from the beginning to the end. I do have some friends that say, I know because they have learned so much from the Bible. I say, you, you've learned a lot, you still don't know. And God has intentionally done it that way. Because if, if you knew it all, if you figured it all out, why would you need God? But God himself knows, he understands. And yet there's this desire to know, to understand why, why am I doing this? How does this fit into to the world, to life, to eternity? And there, there's something that's gotta be there that I haven't quite grasped and I don't understand yet. He says in verse 12, so I concluded, there's nothing better than to be happy, enjoy oneself uh, as long as you can, and people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labors, for these are the gifts of God. Anybody wanna say amen? Yeah, amen, okay, let's close in order. No, okay, we won't, but you know, yeah, sometimes you just go through it and you say, so that's all there is. I don't wanna think, I don't wanna figure it out, I've just concluded that's the best you know, that you can possibly get out of it. So I put this in your outline, just to give you something to think about what he says here. He says that God has decided that everything um, that we desire to do has three things in it. First of all, um, it has a proper point in time. There's a time that you do this and there's a time that you don't. There's a time that you're in this and then there's a time that, that that point is gone and you've missed it. I had a guy one time I was meeting with, he's about 30 years old and uh, he, I, I said, what's, what, what's bothering you so much? And he said, one of the things that bothers me so much is I, I, I didn't get to play high school football and I wanna play high school football. And I said, that time's gone. <laughs> so at 30 years old, you understand, you, you can, I don't think you can get back into high school. I don't know any high schools that will take you, but I think that time is gone. And you've gotta be okay that that time is gone. I missed it, I didn't get to do it. Um, it's not that big a deal. I know he thought it was, but it, it, it's over. It's also, it has a, Everything has a duration. So it lasts only so long, and then, it, then it's gone. Lou Holtz, I always used to love uh, the, the little coach, you know, that uh, coached at Notre Dame and a bunch of places. Lou would always say this. He says, when you're winning, just understand it's not as good as you think. <laughs> he said, but when you're losing, just understand it's not as bad as you think. Right, because it has a time. You start, you go into the next thing. This is over, you move to the next thing. My daughter um, went to the, the Naval Academy and I was watching Navy basketball one time near the end of 
of her time there. And uh, it's one of my favorite stories of this game. They're playing. They had a really good team. They're in the last game of the season that moves them on to the next level in the playoffs. And they had this one, one guy that was their star. He's kind of a guard forward. And uh, he's a senior, and, and he's the star of the team. Everybody relies on him. The game gets down to the end. There's 20-something seconds left, and uh, the other team has the ball. Uh, Navy has a one-point lead. So you know if they, can, if they miss or they can stop them and they get the rebound, they can put this game away. They take a shot. It, it misses, and it rebounds off to the right side in the lane, and this is the guy that grabs the ball. He pulls the rebound down, and I'm like, yes. And as soon as he does, he looks he sees one of his other players on the other side of the court and he throws the ball through the lane under his own basket toward the other player. Well, I, I played a lot of basketball and so I, immediately when he's throwing it, I jump up out of the chair and go, no, because you know, that's, you never make that pass. Why would you make that pass? The other team is in desperation. They're down by one. There's 20 seconds to go. They're going to be looking for an opportunity to steal the ball. And sure enough, as he throws it across the court, a guy cuts in front, catches the ball, lays it up, and now the other team is up by one. I am stomping around. Have you ever done that? I'm just, man, I am just like, ah, oh, I cannot believe it. That is just the dumbest, sorry, I shouldn't say, but, you know, dumbest play. What are you thinking? You're the best player on the team. You're the star. Everybody's counting on you. And my wife, as she will often do, she'll say, who are you talking to in there? You know, so, because uh, there's nobody there but me and the TV, right? And I, I'm just stomping around. I can't, I'm like, man, they had their chance. And this, so I go down the court. This guy goes down the right side of the floor. Uh, he goes down around the baseline. He cuts behind the, in the baseline on the, uh, to the other side, goes by a double pick, comes out on the other side, catches a bounce pass, shoots a three-pointer, hits it, wins the game for them. The, the guy that does the color, you know, he's the guy that really understands the game. He's always a former player. He's talking about that's always the sign. Listen to this. This is really good. He said that's always the sign of a great player. He knows when to let go of the mistake he made and move on to the other play so that he can win the game. Boy, that just stayed with me. In fact, I was just kind of froze right then, you know, because he made the shot and I'm standing, I listened to this and I thought, you know, he's exactly right. And uh, then I stomped around and said, it was still a dumb pass. I can't, you know, it was because, you know, because I, and that's what he was actually saying. He said, there's always a time to come back and say it was a dumb pass, right? But not then, not then. He had to move to the next play or the game is over. And even though I would say, no, it was a dumb pass, the game, no, there's, there's still a chance. Listen, it's the same thing with you and with me. I, I'm not trying to minimize sin or the mistakes that you make. I'm not doing that. What I'm saying is that's the way life works. That's what Solomon is talking about from the perspective of our lives. It has a beginning, it has an end. It has its time, it has its duration. You gotta move on to the next play. You have to. If you don't, then the old play, the old thing that happens stops you, and guess whose fault it is? It's your fault. It's my fault. It is. Because we allowed it to freeze us, to stop us, to keep us from moving on to the next thing. I'm not saying, there's a time to reflect and say, that was wrong, I shouldn't have done that. To make, But in life, you've got to move forward. You've got to take the next thing that God offers you and that God God does. It's the same way in movements like the Jesus Revolution. If you want to go back and scrutinize all the mistakes that that group made, come in, great, no problem. But don't stop moving forward. Don't, don't miss what God is doing in, in the hearts and the lives of people. And it's, it's the same way with us and where we live and what, what we do. I, I will tell you this, that if, if we don't move forward with God, We'll regret it, we will. We don't wanna get caught in just the old things. God is living, God is active, he has his plans. He doesn't change, but the world that we go through and the life that we go through continues to move and to change and God has plans uh, in the middle of all those, uh, those changes and those things that you and I go through. And the, the last one, the third one in there was that it has, everything has a limited enjoyment. Here's what, what uh, Solomon then writes in verse 14. He says, and I know that whatever God does, say this with me, whatever God does is what? He gets to decide. He chooses. He makes his own plans. 
He makes his own movements. Whatever God does, it's final because that's who he is. We don't alter there. We're not allowed to alter there. He says nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken away from it. God's purpose is for people that they should do what? That they should fear him. That means they should respect what God has done, understand what God has done, and that becomes the motivator for them. God himself, so I'm moving forward because of who God is and what he has done. What is happening now has happened before. What is happening in the future has happened before because God makes the same things happen. Say it with me over and over again. Listen, it, it's on purpose so that you can move forward, so that you can know this is not the end of the story. God has more for you. You just gotta let go and move forward in order for uh, God to, to use you and to take you to the next place. So here's chapter number four. I'm just gonna go through a couple verses really quick. Um, we'll fly through it because chapter number four, as I was studying, I went, and here he goes again. He's talking about all the depressing things because Solomon still just could not get away from it that, man, it just seems like that we should be able to fix the world and that he should be able to fix the world. And Again, he says, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. Verse four, he says, then I observed that most people are motivated. This is really encouraging, right? They're motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. That's a bad motivation. But he said, but I've noticed that's, that's what motivates them. They're envious of their neighbor. Then in verse seven, he says, I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure? It is all so meaningless and depressing. So yeah, he goes back, he grinds again through all these things that he doesn't understand, he doesn't know how he's supposed to fix those things. And I thought as I was doing this, I thought, you know, Hopefully Solomon learned from his father. David made his mistakes. He did, he did a lot of things that were bad. But David still would run back to God. He understood, it might seem like you're going backwards when you do that, but it's actually in going to reestablish something that you need in order to move forward in your life. We talked about this last week. The greatest struggle for us is that we have lost the relationship with God that we, we desperately need. And so we're trying to fix that and fill that in in so many different ways that never works. And the only way to do that is to go back and to, to find the God that created you, who gave you life, who rescued you with the life of his son to bring you back into this relationship. That's what you need. That's what you should chase after and seek. So here, this is uh, Psalm 42, Psalm 41, 42, and 42 and 43, most historians would say were probably one Psalm, but this is from Psalm 42 in your Bibles. This is what it says. Here's what David, David says. He says, why am I discouraged? Because <laughs> David was a smart guy too, very powerful guy. He says, why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in who? This is a turning back for David. I'm gonna put my hope in God because he'd done that before and now through his own mistakes and his own sin, man, he's gotten himself in a bad place but he says, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look once again to the God who gives me hope and who rescued me. He says, I will praise him again, my savior and my God. Now I'm deeply discouraged but I will remember you even from distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan and from the land of Mount Bizarre, or I, I like to pronounce it that way. I don't know if that's right, but because it, it reminds me of misery from, from Mount Mazar. I hear the tumult um, of the raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. But each day, the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night, I sing his songs. They're new songs. I sing his songs. He says, praying to God who gives me Life. There's a guy uh, that very passionate preacher, very done a lot of wonderful things, written a lot of books, and I was listening to him 
describe his own life that about 10 or 12 years ago, he was in such deep, deep depression. And just to let you know, people who are usually very passionate and very overly expressive like that usually struggle with depression in their life. They're, they're expending so much energy that they crash and they have a hard time dealing with that. And so even when he's doing all these good things, he says, man, I was in such depths of depression and struggle. And then this is what he said. It's about two in the morning for him. Mine's usually about three in the morning. You wake up because your mind turns on, right? And the things that you're struggling with just wake you up and you're like, what am I gonna do with this? And what I do is I, I've learned I start praying. I pray about those things. I talk to God about those things. I said, you know, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what to deal with this. And I'll, and I'll talk to God uh, about those things. He said what he would do, probably because he would get up and go to another room so he wouldn't wake his wife up. He would sing during those times. He would grab the song, go back to the song, and he would sing once again to God as he's struggling with these things. And it was that singing and that worship of God. And for me, that that lifting it up to God that brought him up out of that, that changed who he was. In fact, look at what, what David goes on to write in the, in the next verse, verse nine. He says, oh God, my rock, I cry. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones. You know, I know you've heard, you know, sticks and stones can break your bones, but taunts or words can do what? N- not true, <laughs> The taunts are worse. You know, you can heal from the sticks and stones, but the taunts, the words, man, they're more powerful. They're more difficult. They're the ones that wake you up at two and three in the morning. And he says, they scoff. Where is this God of yours? Why am I discouraged, he says. Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope on God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. That's why when we worship, it's so important. That's why privately, when you worship God, it's so important. Because in the midst of the discouragement, questions that you're asking that you don't know the answer to, things that you know need to be fixed, you can't fix them, you're turning your heart once again to the God who can. The God who moves, and when he moves, nothing stops what he does. Nothing stops his movement. It, it, he overpowers all of it. And when we turn ourselves back to him, we still have to deal with life, but all of a sudden, God himself, because we go back to him, that puts it in perspective. That, that brings us to a new conclusion about who we are, where we are, and what God is doing in our lives. Let's pray together. And Heavenly Father, we come to you once again because we struggle. It's difficult for us. Um, sometimes we're not even sure why we're struggling because we look at our lives and think, but it, it's, everything's so good. Why would I be struggling? But Lord, we know that there's something missing when we don't look to you, when we don't lift up our hearts to you. We don't sing of the great things, the wonders that you have, you have done. So once again, Lord, in the middle of our lives, the good part, the bad part, we look to you again because You're the one that gave us life. You're the one that put us here. And you're the one who rescued us with your life of your son, Jesus Christ, to bring us back to the God that we need, the hope that we need, the life that we so desperately need. If you're here and you've never put your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, maybe you've just spent most of your life trying to fix it yourself, figure it out yourself, thinking you could do it and realizing that in everything that you did, it still didn't fix it. And maybe now you realize for the first time, it's because I'm missing something, something that only God himself can do to bring me home in my heart. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Come lead me, guide me, show me your way so that as I live my life, I can can sing about the goodness of who you are. I can can lift up my heart and my voice to you in the middle of all my struggles and, and discouraging things of life, knowing that you never desert me. You're always with me because you're the one who gave his life for me. Lord Jesus, fill me with a new spirit, a new hope, a new way of life. In Jesus' name I pray.